Good afternoon. Here we are, August the 18th uh, on a Sunday. And if you're with me, thank you for joining me. And if you've been tracking with this particular sermon series in 1 Peter, and um, you've been uh, blessed by it, I, I hope uh, that you're here with us again so that we can uh, go through another portion of this wonderful letter from the Apostle Peter. And um, just want to begin with a question for us to ponder. And the question is this, what does it mean to be a good citizen? Now, if you were to put that on your favorite search engine, or put that into your favorite search engine, hit the enter button, you would get plenty of opportunities to find many websites that uh, share their ideas on this question. One particular website, for example, offers uh, their readers 25 ways one can be a good citizen. And uh, wikihow.com would suggest to you and me that a good citizen is someone who votes in every election. A good citizen is, uh, means that we respect private and public property as well. A good citizen picks up litter, for example. A good citizen would volunteer in their community to help others. Uh, a good citizen follows the laws and regulations that apply to them. Now, I want to reframe the question. I want to ask you it in this way. What does it mean for a Christian to be a good citizen? We can go back all the way to September 2020, and uh, Mary Carmen, who is a research assistant at the time for Family Research Council, tackled the topic of good citizenship from a biblical perspective. And Mary, in her research, came to the conclusion that uh, there are two flawed views that Christians often have in regards to good citizenship. So on the one side, Mary would suggest that the first view would say that good citizenship means obeying governing authorities to the highest degree. On the other side, polar opposite, it seems, would say that good citizenship only works if a Christian is living in a Christian country. Now, according to Mary's research, these are unattainable. Both of these views are unattainable. Or as Mary said, they have serious shortcomings. And then addressing the first view, Mary concluded this, quote, being a good citizen is not dependent on, a strict, government, on strict government obedience in all things. So we must ask Mary, why not? Why not, Mary? And she provides her answer. Because a government, she said, could command you to perform a moral evil. Then Mary gives an example, I think, which makes uh, a very uh, good point and for her case, and a very solid case, I believe. For it would be true that upholding the values and orders of the Nazi regime during World War II would mean abiding in aiding, I mean, aiding in the uh, orders of the Nazi regime in the extermination of the Jewish people and other atrocities. And then Mary cites uh, a fellow by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you may have heard of him or even know of him or read some of his material, who at the time was a Christian seminary professor who was faced with a difficult situation. Would he, would he obey or oppose the Nazi authority? Of course, we know Bonhoeffer realized that doing evil in service of the governing authorities would be to disobey God. So friends, in the eyes of the Nazi regime, Bonhoeffer was seen as a bad citizen of Germany. And for this, he would be hung from the neck. However, we can say that he was a faithful citizen of God's kingdom. How about the second view that Mary proposed? Well, Mary contends that being a good citizen is not, quote, dependent on being a Christian or living in a Christian country. Again, I, I think Mary's uh, example really makes her case solid. We go back, back in time to 380 AD, and Christianity by that time became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And it was not unknown to have forced conversions. And of course, forced conversions were such a good idea as it was such a good idea as not all citizens were true Christians. 
I think Mary's point is proved. She said, living in a Christian country cannot be a condition for being a good citizen. For there's no exclusive Christian country that has ever existed. And when we think about that, Mary's right. When she considered that those who call themselves Christians today, some are not good citizens. And clearly there are good citizens who are not Christian. So please turn in your Bibles to chapter 2. And uh, we'll be reading from nine, cha- verse 9 to 17. Chapter 2, 1 Peter, verse 9 and following. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, not see, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the Emperor. Lord, bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. And now, we, Lord, we ask by your Holy Spirit that you would, not, you would inform our minds and touch our hearts and then move us into action beyond this day as well. I thank you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, today we're going to unpack the Apostle Peter's statements we find from verse 13 to 17. And I want to begin by saying this particular statement. The Apostle Peter, my friends, was addressing, uh, was being, pardon me, political in this text. Yes, the New Testament writers addressed uh, politics and social issues and other issues in the first century context. And when we think about that, One of the major disadvantages that we have as 21st century Western Christians, we're faced with this uh, thing of trying to understand the ancient Near Eastern worldview, their politics and social order and things like that. Of course, we, as usually, don't have time. We don't have time to do a complete study of ancient Near East culture. You would need to do a formal piece on that. We don't have time to uh, study ancient Near East politics and social issues in depth, but we will need to hit a few points to help us moving forward into this text. First, and I think key in Peter's first century context, is the social distinctions that there were. To give you one example of that, at the time of Peter, the time that Peter was writing his letter, it's estimated there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. The Apostle Peter, as we know here in this particular text in chapter 2, even addresses this issue beginning of verse 18, which we'll be looking at next week. Here's the point. The point is that the social order of Peter's day had a, ma- had a major distinction, such as master and slave, and that'd be uh, important for us to remember that. It's a lot different than today. As for the political context, the major political po- power, of course, in the first century was the Roman Empire. This is an empire built on a bloodshed of superior Roman armies, uh, conquered lands well beyond Rome, and subjected its people to the peace of Rome, or as we say in Latin, Pax Romana. Rome, which began as a republic by the time of Peter's letter, was under the supreme rule of an emperor. And the Roman Senate, which was designed to represent the people, in many ways were simply rubber stamping the emperor's decisions. So these two key features of the political and social order of the first century that we have just addressed briefly here, we keep in mind as we now unpack the text. 
I just want to add one more point to it before we do go to chapter 2, verse 13. One, uh, one, if not one of the highest social and moral values of the ancient Near East, as in the first century, was order, order in society. And to this point, Peter's letter from chapter 2, verse 13, where we're looking at today, all the way into chapter 3, verse 7, provided his audience, his his readers or his audience, a standard, a set of codes, if you will, that govern their social relations, their civic duty and family obligations and so forth, according to their varying stations in that first century setting as Christians. With this background, we now find ourselves here at verse 13 and 14, and let's read that together. Peter said, Be subject for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now, I just want to take a moment together and look at this particular uh, verb that we have translated here for us by the ESV at the beginning of verse 13, be subject. Now, both the NIV, if that's what you're using, and the New King James versions translate this particular uh, original language as submit. But friends, regardless, the meaning here is to be or become inclined or willing to submit or to place or arrange under to subordinate. So we can ask, what was Peter saying here to his audience? What was he trying to communicate? Well, Peter was trying to say, become inclined or willing to submit. We ask submit to who? Well, according to Peter, here in verse 13, to every human institution. And in keeping with Peter's context, be willing to submit to, as he said here, the emperor, or we could say king, it's the same sort of idea, as supreme, verse 13. And furthermore, not only to the king, but also to his representatives, or as we have here in verse 14, to the governors as sent by the king, by the emperor, whichever word you want to use, to govern the empire. Of course, we can extrapolate from there that this would include the local and civic authorities as well. Furthermore, please notice with me the role, if you will, of the human institution, or as the NIV put it, the human authority. What is the role that God ordained for this governing body? Simply to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. Verse 14. These are the lanes that God ordained governing authorities back in the first century and even in our context today. Remember that the greatest and social and moral ethic of the ancient Near East was order in society. And here in this text, Peter highlighted that the governing authority's role was to keep order in society. How? By punishing those who do evil and honoring those who did good. We return to the question, what does it mean for a Christian to be a good citizen? My friends, this would be the same question the first century believer was faced with, and every believer since, in every century, including ours today. So are you, as a Christian, a good citizen in our current political and social context? And to help us answer this important question, we can begin with remembering who we were. Because for, for Peter did this already here in 2 Peter. We need to remember who we are, not we were, we are. Just as he reminded his audience so long ago. Peter said back in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 2, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. See, friends, God fulfilling his redemptive purposes uh, by the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And now believers are members of a new society or as Peter described them in verse 9, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Again, verse 9. 
We can go to the Apostle Paul for some commentary. In his letter to the church in Philippi, he reminded the believers that our citizenship, he said, is in heaven and we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Very interesting to note here, Paul used the same Greek verb, hupa, hupa tasso, or tasso, hupa tasso, pardon me. Don't worry about that. But anyways, that's what it's transliterated as. As Peter did here in our text, it's transliterated, or translated, be subject or submit. So friends, this is it. Jesus Christ is over all things, and all things are subject or subordinate to Christ. You know, let's consider our current political and social climate. In our context, it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that we are living in a divided and polarized time. Over the past few years, social issues and political engagement have primarily been reactive and sometimes even destructive. And not only in society in general, but also in the body of Christ as well. From the year 2020 up to and including today, many who call themselves Christians are often at odds at each other over a variety of social issues, especially in the political landscape. And there's no doubt that the enemy of our souls, Satan himself, and his angels have taken advantage to further divide our cultural context as well as in the body of Christ. For sadly, for many reasons that we don't have time to look at, the body of Christ in many ways has become indifferent. There's been an opportunity to change that, but they have become indifferent. This poison of apathy has infected many individual believers, churches, and denominations. It seems that believers, churches, and denominations pretend that it's business as usual. I think more could be said, but suffice it to say that we are in many ways facing a social and political situation as our first century brothers and sisters were at the writing of Peter's letter. The first century church navigating a culture that was becoming more and more hostile toward Christians from a variety of sources, including the governing authorities. However, Apostle Peter exhorted his audience facing those various trials to be subject to the Lord, sake to every human institution. Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Roman church, said this, that every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Romans 13, 1. We go back to our text, verse 15, where Peter said, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should be put to silence. You should put to, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So you might be asking, Pastor, do good even if the culture or the government is immoral? Yes, but there is a qualification. And in order to understand that, we need to do a little bit of work. We can go to Mark chapter 12, and there we find the events recorded by Mark when the Pharisees, again trying to trap Jesus, said this to them. He said to Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now this is a political issue, is it not? Mark 12, 14. And Jesus replied to these Pharisees, Bring me a denarius, and let me look at it. And then he said to them, Whose likeness and in inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to these Pharisees, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Mark chapter 12, verse 15 to 17. Friends, believers, Christians, are first and foremost loyal to God, and his kingdom. And often this means we will submit to earthly authority and being good citizens unless those earthly authorities are at odds with God's commands that we have in the Holy Scriptures and the Word of God. If they counteract that, then we do not have to obey. We do, must not obey. Peter and the New Testament writers exhorted believers to respect the governing authorities that God had placed in positions of power, whether they are good or not. 
We have to remember, remember two important things with that statement. One, Christians are under the authority of Jesus Christ. And two, being a good citizen of the kingdom of God is reflected in our, and manifest in our citizenship in the world. After all, Peter had told his first century audience, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Verse 12. I have another question for us to ponder. It might, might seem that it's not related, but bear with me. I'll make my points. What is the consequence of a believer's salvation? Think about that. What is the consequence of believer's salvation? And I'm not thinking eternal life here, but that is one of them. We go to the Apostle Paul. Again, when we study the Scripture, Scripture supports Scripture. So we go to the Apostle Paul with this question in his letter to Ephesus, reminding there his audience that at one time they had been dead in the trespasses and sins, just as you and I were. They had once been marching to the drumbeat of the world, just like you and I were. They were following the prince of the air. Who's that? That's Satan and his fallen angels. They were sons of disobedience. Sons meaning men and women of disobedience. Living in the passions of their flesh, like you and I were. By nature, we're children of wrath, along with all of mankind. But thanks be to God, my friends, because of his great love and mercy, God's great love and mercy, they had been made alive together with Christ. We have been made alive together with Christ. We find this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. And friends, believers by God's grace have been saved through faith, not as a result of works, Ephesians tells us, but as a gift of God, so that no one can boast. So what is the result, again, of a believer's salvation? Listen to what Paul said as he moves through chapter 2. Believers are God's workmanship, my friends, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. What were you and I created for in Christ? Or in other words, what is the will of God for you and me? It is for good works. While we live on this earth for good works and that we should walk in them. What does it mean for a Christian to be a good citizen? Verse 14, in our letter, or in Peter's letter, that by doing good, you should put to science the ignorance of foolish people. Verse 14. You see, friends, the Apostle Peter had exhorted our first century brothers and sisters to watch their conduct in their social and political climate. And this rings through the centuries, through the ages, to our divided and polarized context. Reminding you and me to remember who we are and how we live as citizens in our context. As someone once said so well, quote, we ought to be characterized as those who live by the Holy Spirit and not according to the passions of our flesh. My friends, as, as this writer said, this sets us apart from the other citizens of the world. This makes us holy in all our conduct, as God is holy. Well, enough said about that. We could probably work through some more material, but I just want to bring us closer to the end. We want to look at verse 16 momentarily. Let's read that together. Verse 16, Peter said, Live as people who are free, and not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. I think just a general reading of that kind of makes sense. But we still we want to ask the question, how are we to understand the phrase that we find at the beginning here, of verse 16, live as people who are free. What does Peter mean here? Do not use our first century, our 21st century concept of freedom. So we need to appeal again to scripture. We go back with the Apostle Paul for his commentary. In his Roman letter, he said this in chapter 6. Paul said, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. For the long, Paul said, but now that you've been set free from sin and, because sla and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free, pardon me, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, 
the Lord. Again, Romans chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. We go back to Peter's letter where he exhorted his audience. In chapter 1, verse 14, Peter said, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. See, the first century context was full of ignorance, full of people doing their own thing, or what they thought was their own thing, as is our cultural context today. As Peter reminded his audience, God, through his son, Jesus Christ, created a new society, a holy nation, as he describes in the text. Friends, we were created to be ambassadors, representatives of the kingdom of God to come in the kingdom of the world that we live in. We were created as God's workmanship for good works. And as resident aliens or citizens of this world, believers live as people who are free. We're free from sin and the power of death. Sin no longer has power over a believer. We have given the ability to resist temptation. And when we do sin, we have an avenue for forgiveness. As citizens of the kingdom of God, believers do not use this freedom they have in Christ as a cover-up for evil, as sadly many do today. You see this in the divorce rate of the Christians in the world, in the West. I'm not saying there's no good reason for separation. I'm just saying, uh, you know, God brought this other woman into my life. Well, that's not a good reason. That's a cover-up for evil and so forth and so on. Well, as we wrap this up, we can ask the question, what are the qualities of a Christian citizen? I think we've answered what it, a Christian, uh, Christian, what it means for a Christian to be a good citizen, but what are the qualities? What did we do? Well, certainly we would have biblical qualities, would we not? And one of the qualities of a Christian citizen is that they are God-fearing. Apostle Peter already dealt with this with his letter in the first chapter. He said, he said to the elect exiles, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Fear of what? The fear of God. For God will judge everyone impartially, he said. Because after all, you and I were ransomed from our futile ways, Peter would say, by the precious blood of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 19. One of the qualities of a Christian citizen in the world today is the fear of God. Another quality of a Christian citizen would be humility. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. Peter did say here in his letter, in chapter 5, he said, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Why? For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Chapter 5, verse 5 to 7. A Christian walks by the power of the Holy Spirit, displaying, manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what that is? Where Paul teaches of that in Galatians 5, chapter 22, Paul said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are we growing in the fruit of the Spirit? A Christian lives according to the greatest commandment, love God and love your neighbor. Peter talks about this in a way, a different way. In chapter 4, verse 8, Peter said, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. You know, friends, as we draw this to a complete close, I promise there's no room for a Christian today for apathy or indifference as a citizen of the places that we live. We must, we need to be part of the political engagement, part of the political sphere certainly by voting with integrity, but knowing what's going on and being involved in any way that God leads us to. We are to be active as community work, uh, members, supporting our local communities, and beyond maybe if, if God leads us that way, to help others, to do the good works God has called us to do. Of course we obey the laws of the land. That is, unless they're contrary to the word of God. And then if they're contrary, we obviously do not obey them. We can't, because we are, after all, under the authority of Christ, ultimately. Of course we do the good works, as I mentioned, that we were created for to do. Of course we share the gospel of Jesus Christ by our actions and by our words in a spiritually dark world that we live.
All these are the qualities of a Christian as a citizen in the countries that we live, in the communities that we live in this world. Yes, we are to be engaged in a, in a sphere of politics. We are to conduct ourselves honorably. You know, it means that we don't do things like we've seen in our culture. Back in the elections of the United States last time, there was January of that year, there's some terrible things that happened. And there were some Christian names attached to it. These are not things that we should be involved in. Yes, we don't have to stand up against immoral things. Uh, but we don't have to accept the moral behavior from our governments. But we need to do this according to what the scripture has taught us today. So with that note, Lord, uh, friends, Lord, friends, uh, let me pray to the Lord together with you. Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's watching and wherever they are and whatever situation uh, that uh, they are in, whether it's a hard one or whatever it is, Lord, I pray, God, that you would... Uh, be with them and lead them and walk through them. And uh, pray, Lord, that we take this message to heart, that you would help us by your spirit to study it more in the scriptures and be engaged as, in, as good citizens of our culture to uh, stand up against evil doers and evil things and immoral things. And also to, you know, honor the good things too, because there are good things. So, Father, we thank you for these things and ask your blessing on my, on my friends that are listening. And uh, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Thanks, folks. God bless. Shalom.